heard the bell, so, or they imagined hearing the bell, and I'm going to go with it anyway. So let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. Bow with me, please. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we uh, are just in awe of who you are, the character you have, the lessons you've taught us, and the truths you revealed in your word, and the way you provide for us every single day, uh, even uh, when things go great, Lord, uh, sometimes we forget to say thank you. And when things are difficult, Lord, we, we, remember, uh, we remember your role in our lives ever, ever so presently. And Lord, we, we ask that we will be those who are willing to look at your blessings and say thank you and to uh, depend on you when things are difficult. And to look at your truth and look at uh, the way you have treated people through history and learn that you are always present, you're always active, and you're always doing things for us as your creation. Help us to remember, Lord, that we serve you and that this life is not about us, it's about you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in the book of Micah, if you want to open up your Bibles there. Uh, I think in the original schedule it has two classes designated for Micah. We're going to do our best to get it done in one class and uh, just try to go ahead and plow through. As you can tell, I'm trying to build in some extra space. Uh, I, I think I've told you all because I, I want to spend at least a few classes on the book of Isaiah uh, and be able to squeeze that in also. Uh, you'll see, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Isaiah tonight in this class. So, uh, Book of Micah, uh, there, it's just the next one of our minor prophets as we go in order. Uh, we are uh, not, we don't really know anything about Micah other than he is a prophet and he is the one who, who gave us this book. Uh, we know his name means who is like Yahweh or who is like Jehovah. Uh, he kind of follows that pattern of ah and L at the end of a name. Uh, that is somewhat fitting because you see that expression or a similar expression here near the end of the book. If you look in chapter 7, verse 18, somebody read that. Uh, chapter 7, verse 18. Okay, so that, that beginning expression there, who is a God like you, who is like Jehovah, uh, that, that expression is what his name means. And so it's just kind of appropriate uh, to see that. Um, his contemporary is Isaiah. So if you look back in uh, Micah chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, of Morshite, uh, the Morshite, what he saw regarding Samaria and Jerusalem in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, flip with me in your Bibles. Just hold your place in Micah, obviously, because that's where we'll be spending the bulk of our time this evening. But Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1, you have a, a very similar verse. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah. And so you have essentially the same list of kings. Maybe Isaiah was, was a prophet a little longer, uh, but you've got essentially the same list of kings. You've got uh, a lot of similarities here between Micah and Isaiah, even the concept of who is like Yahweh. If you uh, Isaiah chapter 45 and 46 are very famous for those verses where, you know, who is like God, there is no other God. You know, that, that, that expression repeated um, over and over again through the book of Isaiah. You have the same thing here with Micah and the way that he prophesies, and both by his name and by the way that he talks. And so, that becomes, I, I think, maybe it helps us to understand what's going on at the time. Uh, you look at that list of kings we've got there, okay? Again, in Micah, you got Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. What do we know about those kings? Do what? 
Okay, kings of Judah. Okay. Who? Okay, Hezekiah was a great king. Okay, uh, you, you uh, go back and look at his story back uh, second. Kings there, you've got good things said about Hezekiah. Uh, what do we know about Ahaz? Okay, no, yeah, not so good. Uh, we're not as, as, as pleased with uh, the things that Ahaz had done. Uh, he is over in, trying to get my, my bearings here, back in 2 Kings. Uh, what about Jotham? Well, it, if you look back in 2 Kings 15, uh, Jotham, son of Uzziah, became king of Judah. He was 25 years old. He reigned 16 years. His mother's name was Jerusha. He did what was right in the, sight of, in the Lord's sight, just as his father Uzziah had done. Yeah, there is, there is. So this one, if you're looking at the, the, the kings we're looking at specifically here, you know, Isaiah lists four kings. Micah lists three kings, but of the, of the ones Isaiah listed, three of the four are good, and the ones that Micah lists, two of the three are good, right? So it, it's interesting what you have here during a time period that was probably, uh, as far as the divided kingdom goes, the best time in their history. Like these are, this is the, the most good kings in a row you can possibly get with Ahaz kind of ruining the, ruining the, 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 the deal here. Uh, but you've got Uzziah's good, Jotham's good, Ahaz, not good, Hezekiah's good, you know, and so Isaiah's going and prophesying to these kings who are good, who do good in the sight of God, who apparently have a respect for God in his word. Do you think they have a respect for Isaiah? Yeah, I mean, Probably more than most of the other kings would, at least. Uh, same with Micah. So it's interesting. You've got somewhat of a different focus in these, this, this storyline or this prophecy that you have in a lot of the other ones. What's astonishing, though, is how much similarity you have between Micah and the other prophets. You know, there's going to be a lot of similarities in Micah and Amos. Well, what did we decide about Amos? Was he positive or negative? Negative. Like, I mean, everything in the book was bad except the last five verses. Like it, of however many chapters that was, seven, I think. I mean, everything bad. Might be nine. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff talked about by Amos. Micah sounds a lot like Amos in a lot of his book. Not all of it. He's not nearly as... as overwhelmingly negative as as Amos was. Uh, what you have with Isaiah and Micah is they're both messengers of God. They both seem to focus on the social misconduct and the moral misconduct of the people. Uh, they are both concerned with the fact of even while you are, have a good king, while you should be doing good, you're still doing bad. And if you're going to continue to do bad, even though all things point to the fact that you should be doing good, then God is justified in bringing destruction. Uh, and so you see that same sort of focus and idea uh, here with Micah. So, um, so again, they, they prophesied during times of relatively positive or faithful or kings that did good in the sight of the Lord, but still they're bringing up the bad things that the people are doing. They're bringing up the, the negative. They're bringing up the uh, mistreatment of the poor. They bring up the complacency of the people, that the people aren't, aren't really focused on God. They're focused on themselves, the selfishness of the people. You still have a lot of focus on sin. Uh, I, I bring that up because I want us to recognize we, I'll, I'll, I'll step on my own toes here. I have a tendency to read through the minor prophets and find a lot of similarities. Maybe, maybe you agree with that. <laughs> you know, you hear the, uh, it's almost cyclical of, you did bad, you're going to be destroyed. You did bad, you're going to be destroyed. You did bad, you're going to be destroyed. Like, and that, that's kind of, uh, you feel like you're teaching the same lesson over and over again as you go through the minor prophet. 
But at understanding the context of the ones that we can, because some of them you can't, and understanding uh, the, the, the contrast, the differences between the books that really make the lessons come alive. For me, one of the lessons in studying Micah, although we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, is, is that it doesn't matter if you are uh, in, in dire straits and things are horrible and you, you are surrounded by wicked people, or if things are good, you've been blessed, you've got a good king on the throne, if you choose to sin, God will judge you for it. We tend to, again, I'll step on my toes, I tend to justify sins based on circumstances. You ever done that? It's interesting that as you go through the minor prophets, the circumstances don't matter. It's the sin and the redemption that matters. Do you, isn't there a lesson there? Uh, Y'all seem to all have it. You're all nodding, so we'll move on. All right, so here's the uh, outline we're going to be working off with the book of I, uh, Micah. Now I'm in a mood to talk about Isaiah. So uh, the book of Micah, a uh, sentence on God, of, of God upon an idolatrous kingdom. In chapter 1, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, the bill of particulars, I've changed some of these titles when we get to the other screen. Uh, the oppression by upper classes, the ultimate triumph of God's grace, God's uh, controversy or problem or frustration he has with an ungrateful Israel, and then the fulfillment of a covenant promise. I stole this out of a out of a book that I have that talks about the minor prophets. Um, you know, and again, Micah is probably of all the minor prophets the most disorganized. I, I don't know if did anybody else pick up on that. So a lot of these prophets I can read through and I get a general sense of where they're going. And Micah's all over. Like I had to read it multiple times. Going, what's he talking about now? Like, I mean, he's just he's, he's the ADHD prophet. I mean, he he's he's all over the place, uh, and it's kind of hard to follow his train of thought because you're like, is he where I think he is, or do I need to go back and re? Uh, I, I, again, I, maybe that was just me, but maybe I have ADHD, and that's the problem, that, which is also true. So. You look like you're going to say something. All right, so, um, so again, some of these outlines are, uh, you know, trying to force an organization that might not be there. Uh, that's the one I went with. I'm not sure it's the one I'm happy with. But the first part of the book is the sentence of God on an idolatrous, on idolatrous kingdom. So what you have here at the beginning of the book of Micah is there, like there have been with several of the other minor prophets, a long listing of other nations, and particularly here we've got other cities. Uh, you don't have nations talked about by Micah as much as you have cities. And the cities, it basically just kind of wraps them all up into one. Uh, when you've got other prophecies like Amos that talk specifically about the sins of a particular group of people. Uh, Micah doesn't really do that. Uh, if you look here, let me get back over to it. Uh, you look here, he just kind of just talks about them in general terms of you're all going to die uh, a horrible, awful, judgmental death. I mean, it, it's, he just lump, lumps them all together poetically. Uh, because of this, uh, uh, excuse me, back in 6 and 7, just chapter 1, 6 and 7. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the countryside, a planting area for a vineyard. I will roll her stones into the valley and expose her foundations. All her carved images will be smashed to pieces. All her wages will be burned in the fire, and I will destroy all her idols." Since she collected the wages of a prostitute, they will be used again for a prostitute. But then when you look beyond that, uh, that's Samaria, verse 10, don't announce it in Gath, don't weep at all, roll in the dust in Beth Lephephra, depart in shameful nakedness, you residents of Shafir. So, I mean, he doesn't get into the specifics of each individual place. He just basically says, all of you need to cry and mourn and weep and shed tears because it's going to be awful for everyone. Uh, and if you look at this list of cities, which 
you know, I, I have a thorough background knowledge of every single one of the, I really don't. I, I know a few of them. Gath, we know, is where? Okay, Philistia, so we know that's a foreign city. You know, Lachish, we're familiar with. We've read of them in other places. Most of these we've not. Uh, they are just random cities of the nations around them. Uh, and so basically, it's just Micah lumping everybody together in all of your cities, you're involved in idolatry, you're involved in prostitution, you're involved in sin. We'll talk about the sin specifically in just a moment. But basically, he just opens up the door for all of you will be judged. And you'll be judged in a somewhat apocalyptic way, is the way it describes it. You know, mountains melting, valleys splitting, heaps of ruin. Um, whether those are literal descriptions of cities being torn apart down to their foundation or whether they are uh, fantastical descriptions of cities just being destroyed, the point doesn't change. Cities will be destroyed. Your, your cities will be demolished. Why do you think he focuses on cities? Yeah, and, and the cities were the, honestly the places where they, that's where they felt they were strong, right? When a, when a foreign army came near, where, where did everybody go? Inside the city wall, closed the gate. I mean, that's where we go to be protected. So if the cities are destroyed down to their foundation, what do you do now? Nothing. I mean, you're, you're completely exposed at that point. And that's the point here of, of you know, you're, all of this destruction is coming, and it is coming because God declares it. Simple enough reason. Okay? Uh, and, and so I think that's interesting to, to see uh, Micah's differences there in the way some of the others. Here's some of the sins that, that are listed in chapter 2 that they're involved in, they scheme iniquity. So they don't just involve themselves in iniquity. They don't just sin on accident or get caught up in the moment. They scheme it. They plan it. And not only do they plan it, they plan it from the very moment they wake up before they even get out of bed the description here is that they sit there before they've had their morning coffee going, what can I get away with today? So before their feet hit the floor, they're already planning out the bad things they're going to do that day. That's a pretty thorough wickedness, wouldn't you say? Uh, and, and that's the point of you know, this isn't accidental. This isn't just you know, things that have happened. You are literally being wicked people who plan to do evil from the very moment you wake up. You covet people's fields, you seize them, you steal their property, you steal their, when you steal their land, you're stealing their livelihood, you rob people, you evict women and children. It mentions near the end of chapter 2, while this isn't necessarily listed as a uh, as a sin, per se, uh, it is interesting the way he talked about wine. Uh, verse 11, if a man comes and utters empty lies, I will preach to you about wine and beer. He would just be the preacher for this people. What do you think he means by that? Any thoughts? put you on the spot here this is chapter 2 verse 11 yeah yeah I mean it, it, it it's something you're involving in and, and again just because he's saying I will preach to you uh, about uh, the New American Standard uses a different word there that doesn't mean he's going to preach to them about the, the the wrongness of wine and beer uh, you know, he's, uh, he, if somebody's going to come in and teach you about wine and beer, he'd be the best person for this group of people because these people love wine and beer. 
you know. I mean, that, that's the idea here. Uh, we, use, we think preach, and we think, oh, well, he's teaching moral things. Not necessarily. It could just mean proclaim, talk about. Uh, he's going to come teach to you about alcohol, you know. Uh, and so, uh, again, he just fits right in. He, he's perfect for these people. He, he's exactly the way these people are. They're all about leisure and fun and ease of life, and this man just kind of fits in with that. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 talked about the idea that the rulers and the heads of the houses themselves know no justice. Okay, why is that important? Yeah, and what's the job of the rulers and the head of houses? Yeah, they're the, they're the judges. They're the ones who are supposed to be advising, guiding, making sure right things happen. Well, they don't even know about justice. Like They, they don't have any concern about justice. Uh, and he goes on to say there in verse 2, you hate good and love evil. So how is, how is anybody going to get better if the rulers and the heads of houses are these kind of people? What's interesting to me about that is remember the context in which this is written. Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah. Those were the rulers that loved God. But just because the king had an affection God or an attachment to God, does that mean that that has rolled down into all the people? No. And that's part of the difficulty here. We wonder how over and over and over again through the story, you get a good king, but as soon as that king dies, what happens? I mean, the people just fall off the wagon. Like they, they have no concern over good whatsoever. They're not really serving God. It's because their own local people don't know God. They don't know justice. They don't know good. And therefore, they're not promoting those things. Dallas? Yeah, yeah, and, and that this is a you know just a, a perfect picture of that of you know we know the kings at this time other than Ahaz were good kings, but the heads of houses and the rulers weren't. Uh, they love good evil, and then it even goes on, and this is the, one of the most uh, visual descriptions you have in any of the minor prophets of being evil people. Uh, second part of verse 2, you tear off people's skin and strip their flesh from their bones. You eat the flesh of my people after you strip their skin from them and break their bones. You chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron. You're as bad as cannibal. Okay. Why, why do you think that's the description here? You've got to remember, this is a people who, by law, weren't allowed to eat certain things because they were unclean. How do you think they responded to that kind of description of their sins? No, we're not that bad. No, no. I mean, we would never. You know, but Micah's description here is, this is the kind of people you are. You are, you are like cannibals. Uh, and I don't know that he is being figurative in the sense of, you know, gossip or, you know, those types of things. I think he is saying you are as wicked and evil as the most atrocious and horrifying people that could exist. You are like them with the way that you sin. And, not, and particularly the rulers are like them in the way that they sin. And then if the rulers and the heads of houses weren't bad enough, you've got this next section in chapter 3 which talks about even the prophets are leading people astray. 
Uh, you look down in verse 11 and 12, yet they lean on the Lord saying, isn't the Lord among us? No disaster will overtake us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become ruined, and the temple mountain will be a high thicket. You know, you're sitting, you're walking around proclaiming that everything is good and that God is happy and that everybody is doing what they should be doing, that God is among us and therefore nobody can overthrow us. We're in no danger. We've got God on our side. And th the prophet should have been the one to know God was not on their side. But the prophets are running around spreading lies and of course, that doesn't do well, right? And, and that, again, I want you to put yourself back into this situation. You've got prophets who are lying to you, who are leading you astray, who are teaching you wrong, who are giving you a false sense of security and hope. You've got heads of houses and rulers who are evil, they call evil good and good evil. They don't understand morality. They don't, they don't defend justice. What do you do? I mean, get the, how do things get better in that case? And I think that's God's point in some of these minor prophets is things have gone so south, they've gotten so bad, that there's not enough people there to turn this thing around anymore. So the only fix is to stop it in its tracks and start over. And that's essentially what God does. God brings judgment, stops them in their tracks, and then through all the prophets, he prophesies this remnant, and the remnant comes back and God makes something beautiful out of the remnant, out of this spare piece that was tossed aside. God does something with that that brings hope to the world. Does that all make sense? And, and when you read a book like Micah, it helps you to understand why that was a necessary process. Had God tried to, to save this over and over and over again? Yes. Over and over and over again. But even back, I mean, you read through Second Kings and you read the story of Uzziah and Jotham and Hezekiah and you're like, yes, we're finally going to get there. And it doesn't get there. It doesn't get any better. And the people just fall right back into sin. And, and you realize, you know, God, God's sending prophets when things are good to try to help things get even better. But when nobody will even listen and there's this kind of corruption that is keeping things from getting better, sometimes it's easier to tear it down, right? Uh, and so that's essentially what, what happens here, okay? Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, chapter 4 and 5, you've got the uh, coming kingdom, which is contrasted with the current kingdom, okay? Uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, I want to read verse 1 and 2 here. Or somebody else, read verse 1 and 2. Chapter 4, 1 and 2. All right, so a beautiful description of the coming kingdom, okay? I mean, that, that's what everybody hoped for. Well, kind of, okay? So here, here's what makes it interesting. Uh, this description of the kingdom that God intended, you contrast it with the description of the way things currently are, even when things are good, Again, remember our context, Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah. Things are supposedly good. But even when things are good, are they really good? Not according to Micah, not according to God. 
And so when you contrast this picture of what God intends for his kingdom to look like with what it currently looked like at the time that this is written, it helps you realize what they were trying to accomplish, what, what, what good they could have done as a people didn't in any way measure up to what God wanted. God wanted something beautiful, perfect, that, that would unite all nations. So chapters 4, verses 1 through 5 talked about this. It's a place of unity. It's a place where people from every nation can be accepted. You get down to verse 6 through 8. It's a place of healing. It's a place where, where uh, you know, the, um, here, you know, I will assemble the lame and gather the scattered, those I have injured, I will make the lame into a remnant, those far removed into a strong nation. So it, it, you know, God, God can bring healing to the people. He can bring acceptance to the people. You know, all of that was stuff that was not possible in their human kingdom. All of that was stuff that, honestly, they didn't even really want. Uh, having just studied Jonah on Sunday, did, did, did they look favorably on the foreigner? No. Did God look favorably on the foreigner? A redeemed foreigner? Yeah. And so God had this intention to build a kingdom that was entirely different than what was possible for them, uh, and it was a place where things would be good. The problem with this people, though, is that if you look at the last half of chapter 4, they are looking for rescue or for things to get better from the wrong place. Uh, why are you shouting loudly? Is there no king with you? Has your counselor perished so that anguish grips you like a woman in labor? Verse 10, writhe and cry out, daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you will leave the city and camps in the open field. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the grasp of your enemies. Okay, what's he saying here? Yeah, yeah, this is going to get a lot worse before it's going to get better. But it will get better. But it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Uh, I've always, uh, uh, whenever I have to, um, well, have to, let, let me rephrase that. Whenever I let my spaces get out of control, whether that be my office, which happens regularly, or my garage space, which happens even more regularly. The only way I can redeem those spaces is to literally take everything out and then to intentionally put things back in in place. Okay? Is anybody else like that? Thank you, Jody. I appreciate it. In Dallas. I We'll start a uh, support group. Um, so, it, 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 you know, the, the only way I can redeem it is to remove everything, make it, you know, make it real bad for the stuff by, by removing it from its home, and then I can bring it back into its home the way it's intended to be. And that's essentially the picture you have here of God, of, you know, you, you're trying to be rescued you're looking to the foreigner. You're looking for, for outside help. It's not going to come. You will be rescued by being sent away and brought home. That, that, that's the way this is going to happen. And ultimately, in chapter 5, it gets into where the true rescue comes from. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but uh, obviously you can't teach the book of Micah without at least pointing out uh, the prophecy here about Jesus. Uh, verse 2 uh, chapter 5, verse 2, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Right, now, we know that's talking about Jesus. Now, even the Jews knew that was talking about Jesus. How, did they, how do we know they knew? Okay, it's quoted when? So remember when the wise men come from the east and they come and they want to know where the king is who's been born, what do the uh, learned men from Jerusalem say? 
He's in Bethlehem. It's prophesied he will be born in Bethlehem because of this verse. What's interesting is that they, they, the Jews understood the first part, the idea of Bethlehem Ephrata, uh, one will come from you to be a ruler over Israel for me. They didn't get the second part. You see the second part of that verse? His origin is from antiquity, from ancient time. You know, we, the birth of the Redeemer, the birth of the Messiah, they got. The origin of the Messiah, they didn't. Isn't that interesting? That's not what they were expecting, right? They were expecting a human to be raised up, to be a deliverer for them, not one who was God in the flesh. Uh, so even the prophecy alludes to that, that he is, you know, like Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. You know, Jesus makes that reference. So, but what you have, it, you know, they, they're looking for, they, they don't understand how rescue is going to happen. They don't, honestly, they don't understand that they need rescue. So, you know, but when they need rescue, they're going to look to the wrong places. And, and what, what Micah says is, no, you're going to be taken away. You're going to be brought back. But the way you're truly going to be saved is that God is going to raise up a ruler who is going to be the one that you've been waiting for. He's the Messiah. He's the one that keeps being promised, and he's continuing to be promised. And so you've got that great uh, hopeful message here in chapter 5. Okay, You get over to chapter 6, and you have this... Uh, you know, God having an issue with the people. You know, and the, one of the issues that we've heard again and again from God about Israel is all that God has done for them, but they have not reciprocated. They have not been thankful. They have not been obedient as a result. So chapter 6, verses 1 down through verse 5, you've got God sort of telling the story of what he's done. You know, here, uh, rise, plead your, pay, your case before the mountain, Listen to the Lord's lawsuit, verse 2, you mountains and enduring foundation, because the Lord has a case against his people. Verse 3, my people, what have I done to you, or how have I wearied you? You know, have I offended you? Have I done something wrong to you? Have I not taken care of you? He goes on to say, I brought you up from Egypt. I redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam ahead of you. Remember what King Balak of Moab proposed, what Balaam son of Beor answered him, and what happened in the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, so that you may acknowledge the Lord's righteous act. Essentially, God says, I have done everything I said I would do. I have protected you. I have redeemed you. I have provided for you. I have... Uh, made sure that no one could cast curses on you. I have done everything. So I've done my part. Then he goes on to this next little section that we like to quote. What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come with him with burnt offerings? With year old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? So some of your versions don't put those in forms of questions. Some of your versions just give the answer. God doesn't want this. God doesn't want this. God doesn't want this. So what does God want? Verse 6, or excuse me, verse 8. He has told each of you what is good and what he requires. To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I think sometimes we miss the heart of the message of this verse. Okay? We talk about this verse because it's lovely and it makes a good three-part sermon. Uh, that's honestly why we love this verse as much as we do. Uh, you know, it, it really is a lovely verse. Uh, and we, we talk about just, you know, what all these pieces mean and, and how, how great it is. You know what the real message of this verse is? I've done everything for you, and I've asked for this much. And you can't even do it. It is not a lovely verse or a lovely sentiment as much as it is an accusation. 
It is an accusation that you can't even do the smallest thing, which is, verse 8, to act justly. We've already proven that wrong in this prophecy. To love faithfulness. Have they done that? No. And to walk humbly with your God. Have they walked humbly with God? No. This is God dropping the gavel on them. If you look at the language of this chapter, he says right there at the beginning of chapter 6, let the hills hear your complaint. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit. This is God sitting on the judge's bench with the gavel in his hand, pronouncing judgment on this people, saying, you can't even do the simplest of simple things. I'm done. Okay? I, I want you to get that. This is not a sentiment. It is a judgment. And it is a strong judgment. Again, the other thing I think we get wrong about this verse is that we act like this is a great summation of the total of what we're supposed to do. It's not. This is the simplest of what we're supposed to do. It's the simple. It's not hard to act justly. It's not a hard thing to do. We struggle with it because we're selfish. But it's not a hard thing to do. It's not a hard thing to love faithfulness. Nothing is difficult about that. It is not hard to be humble before an almighty creator. Don't we still struggle with it? So shame on us, that gavel could be dropped on you and me too. And that's where I think this is so important that we understand this verse in context, is that this verse really, uh, I mean, it, it backs you and me and particularly these people into a corner where there is nowhere to go, nowhere to escape, nowhere that, no way that you can justify your lack of obedience anymore. God has done everything and required so little, and we still don't even measure up. Shame on us. Shame on these people, which is really where Micah is focusing. So you get to chapter 7, uh, and basically it is, since we've already dropped the gavel here, the end of chapter 6 is the, the verdict of the judgment that God basically says, okay, so we're done. Uh, this, this is kind of uh, verse 13. As a result, I've begun to strike you earnestly, bringing desolation because of your sin. You will eat and not be satisfied, for there will be hunger within you. What you acquire, you cannot save. What you, will say, what you do save, I, I will give to the sword. You will sow but not reap. You will press off. So basically, I'm removing all of your blessings because you can relate nearly all of that back to the blessings he promised them if they were faithful to him and they would live in their land forever because he would bless them and, and take care of them. And then chapter 7, how sad for me, I am one who, when the summer fruit has been gathered after the gleaning of the grape harvest, finds no grape cluster to eat, no early fig which I crave. Faithful people have vanished from the land. There is no one upright among the people. All of them wait in ambush to shed blood. They hunt each other with a net. Both hands are, are good at accomplishing evil. I mean, basically... You are evil through and through. Uh, you, you know, I, I've removed my blessing from you. You continue to do evil. So, uh, God does say, before he finishes, though, verse 7, but I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God. Micah goes on to pray. Uh, where's the Lord your God? My eyes will look at her. Or, excuse me. The, the enemy will say, where's the Lord your God? Uh, Micah. Excuse me. That kind of is Micah's prayer. Um, but then verse 14. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock that is, in your, or that is your possession. They live alone in the woodland, surrounded by pastures. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in ancient times. I will perform miracles for them as in the days of your exodus from the land of Egypt. 
Nations will see and be ashamed of all their power. They put their hands over their mouths and their ears will become deaf. They will lick the dust like a snake. They will come trembling out of their hiding places like reptiles slithering on the ground. They will tremble in the presence of the Lord our God. They will stand in awe of you. So when God finally brings you back, when God finally restores, when God makes this good again, the nations will marvel at it. So God, being the source of salvation, being the source of justice, uh, will cause them to marvel, which is what brings him to his conclusion, which is his name. So we remember back this, this, this prophecy essentially begins with the statement, who is a God like you, because that's Micah's name, and then it ends with that. And I love these three verses. I, I love them even better than Micah chapter uh, 6, verse 8. Uh, th these, these three verses. Who is a God like you for giving iniquity and passing over rebellion for the rem remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. Now that, that shows the other side of God, doesn't it? We've seen a God of anger of anger and retribution and judgment through much of this book. But you've got these conclusion statements in these prophecies that bring us back to a God who is joyful with his people because a new kingdom has been established. So he delights in faithful love. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show loyalty to Jacob and faithful love to Abraham as you swore to our ancestor, ancestors from days long ago. So in the end, is it all going to be about judgment and punishment and, de and destruction? No. In the end, I love that the way Micah puts it here is it actually gets back to being about the promises of God to bless all nations through Abraham. Because notice who he brings up here at the end. You will show loyalty to Jacob and faithful love to Abraham. God promised the seed to Abraham and Jacob. Now we assume he did the Isaac in there in the middle. I don't believe we have a reference to it though. What you have is Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 where God lays out the promises as he would leave his land and go to the land God would show him. And then you've got Jacob over when Jacob had that vision of the ladder that went up into heaven and God spoke to him from the top and God reiterated his promises to Jacob there. And what Micah is saying is when all is said and done, this is not the end of the people this will bring us back to the promises that God gave when he started this whole thing with Abraham. God promised through Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Well, if you're looking at the destruction of the entire people, doesn't that make that hard to believe? Where, how's God going to fulfill his promise? What Micah is saying is, don't doubt. God is still the God of salvation. He's still the God that is going to bring about his compassion, his love, his promises, because God is faithful. Okay? Does that all make sense? I, I know. I did more talking than I should have tonight because I wanted to get through all of it in one, in one class so that we can have time to go uh, spend a little bit of time in Isaiah. We have a couple of minutes. Any comments, questions, additions? Anything I breezed over you wanted to spend more time on? Talk so fast that people are still trying to catch up. That's okay. So, all right. Well, then, uh, Dallas, yes. It wasn't in that part of Amos that we already went over of uh, Amaziah's like, can you go down to 
somewhere else and do your work. He's like, I'm not even a prophet. I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly the case. Uh, we'll we'll have some fun with that one when, when when we get there. But absolutely. And what's interesting to me about that is is everything they said negative? No. If they would just do what the Lord required, things could be good again. For the early ones, for the later ones, yes, it all got negative because there was no hope for them at that point until after the captivity. But anyway, we'll uh we'll end there. Read Nahum for Sunday. And uh, thank you for your attention.